inflation is a hot topic. Even more so right now, I'm very happy to have Richard Veig here with us again. He has done an extensive research into inflation and expanding money supply. Welcome, Richard, and thank you very much for taking your time with us again. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Our pleasure. Uh, before we get into your empirical research, can you elaborate a bit about the consequences to our lives and society when wrong view of inflation is applied in politics? Well, as you know, uh, theory was espoused quite fervently in the 1970s and 1980s that inflation was a monetary phenomenon. In other words, if the money supply was growing too fast, that would inevitably result in inflation and that the antidote was high interest rates because high interest rates would curb lending, uh, would make it more expensive to individuals and businesses um, and therefore put brakes on the economy. If, if businesses are earning less and if individuals are spending more on interest, uh, they have less to spend on other economic activity and the economy slows down. Well, to me, you better really be certain that it's monetary policy that leads to this inflation and this is the correct cure because it is very damaging to individuals. It's a very blunt tool. And you're in essence saying by harming, broadly harming uh, households and businesses across the economy, we will bring inflation under control and you bring real damage to real lives as a result. And I think as we may discuss, I'm not certain it's monetary uh, growth that brings inflation in the first place. So in that case, you've harmed people thinking it was bringing in a good outcome when that may in fact not be the case. So it's, it's a very important area to discuss. Mm. Okay. How so how did you do the research? Like what data did you use from what countries and so on? Well, you know, I've been, you know, inflation has been a hot topic. I'm ever since I was young, you know, I came up, I think in the Milton Friedman era when he would regularly say inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And I just kind of took that as a given. It's as you do. And, you know, we, we kind of rollicked along and, you know, the decades passed and, you know, if there's, if there's any economic principle, the man on the street seems to know it's that high government spending or high monetary growth bring inflation. Everybody seems to know that. And I thought, you know, that's not that difficult of a thing to test. We have lots of data on lots of countries. And it's not complicated to go in and look at uh, high monetary growth periods and see if they're followed by high inflationary periods. And in fact, between the OECD and the BIS and other places, you have pretty good data on 47 of the 50 largest countries in the world, which together constitute about 91 or 90 or 91 percent of world GDP. So we went in there and we took them all, we lined up. Uh, inflation data in one column and money supply growth in the next column. And we came up with a variety of assumptions. You know, let's say, you know, inflation is more than 10% per year. I mean, not, not much. Money supply growth is more than 10% per year for three years. You know, look to see if in the next five or 10 years, there are instances of high inflation. And you can make a different assumption. You can say, you know, if inflation is 7% for five years, I mean, you can make any assumption you want. So we took kind of a, a, a basket of assumptions and ran all of them, kind of check ourselves. And lo and behold, much to our surprise, inflation did not often follow high money supply growth. No. It did not. And conversely, periods of high inflation often were not preceded by high monetary growth. And it, and it wasn't a close call. 
no matter which way we ran the, the numbers. You know, it was inflation is frequently not preceded by high monetary growth. And um, uh, high monetary growth is frequently not followed by high inflation. Um, so we, we kind of came to the conclusion, I think, you know, people have been obsessive about the 70s. Um, but when we looked at it broadly, it was hard to substantiate. And, and then, you know, you, you just have to look at a couple of other places to kind of confirm this. And one of the obvious places is Japan, where, you know, since 1998, which was their big crisis, uh, government debt growth and money supply growth have been very high. Um, uh, and yet their inflation has been zero, has been zero, effectively zero. I think now it's creeping up to 1%, which has got them in a tizzy. But um, we, 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 um, if you look at government debt in Japan compared to the United States, they're at, let's call it 240% of GDP is their government debt. And we're at what, 130 or something like that. So almost twice our level. Same thing on money supply. Their money supply to GDP is like 211%. Ours is like 90 something percent, or at least it was when we measured it year in. Uh, the disparity is gigantic. And yet their inflation has been zero. So it's it's really hard to, given that data, to come to any conclusion about money supply growth causing inflation. And then the coup de grace, if you will, is the 08 crisis in the United States where obviously money supply growth uh, from a government intervention was very high for a couple of years after. And of course we got no inflation. So, um, you know, inflation needs to be studied the causality of inflation needs to be, uh, you know, we need to arrive at theories about it. Uh, but it is clearly not the case that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Well, it sounds that's actually a very, very low uh, correlation to the uh, uh, growth of the money supply when you say like that. And did you find any, anything? connected to interest rate, or as you talked about central banks, balance sheets, or government debts that show that they cause inflation? We did all those exact same correlations related to exactly those three things. So we looked at it to try to correlate to high government debt growth. We separately looked at it to try to correlate it to high central bank balance sheet growth. And we also tried to correlate it to interest rates. And I'll tell you, there's little, if any, correlation to the size of the central bank balance sheet or government debt. As regards interest rates, you know, um, it, really not there either, you know, even though extremes in interest rates, you know, almost like self-fulfilling prophecies in some cases, but um, no, it was, it was none of the above. Wow. This is very interesting, especially if you're a Milton Friedman fan. So, so, uh, <laughs> so what Milton Friedman's one of those guys. The more I study him, the more I find he's a re reliable indicator of what's not correct. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I take your word for it. Uh, so, so what 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 should we learn from uh, this study that you did? Well, I think what what we did, what I did actually very recently was look in the United States at um, what our instances of inflation were. And, and, and kind of as a background, I took the, um, the, um, some studies that have been done on crises over hundreds of years. And what, what we did was we looked at the type of crises and multiple, applied it by the GDP of the country that experienced the crises to see what kinds of crises were the most prevalent in economic history, uh, particularly since World War II, because there's stock market crashes that are separate from financial crises. There's inflation crises. Uh, there's financial crises, which we've actually discussed, you know, and a couple of other types. And it turns out inflation, if weighted by GDP, is one of the least frequently occurring crises that you have. 
And so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to do that because the amount of intellectual horsepower that's been dedicated to inflation versus the frequency of occurrence are out of sync. Uh, we know inflation occurs in smaller countries. We know that tends to be correlated to having uh, borrowing that's in a foreign currency and large trade deficits. That's pretty easy to understand. That relates pretty specifically to smaller economies. Um, uh, in larger developed economies, inflation has really not been a problem that often uh, historically. So we looked at the United States and there's really been eight instances of inflation. If you define inflation as two years of 5% or more, which is not that high of a bar, by the way. Mm -hmm. And of the eight, four of them were related to major wars. War of 1812, Civil War, First World War, Second World War. Those are pretty easy to understand because supplies have been decimated. Farms were turned into battlefields, so the price of grain goes up, that sort of thing. So, and by the way, they end very abruptly. In all four of those cases, like in World War II, it reached 14% in 1947, 14.4%. And by 1949, it was, was negative 1% inflation. Wow. So, you know, all of these war-related instances of inflation go negative after about three years. So it's not, it doesn't set up this era of inflation. If anything, it sets up an era of deflation. And in the Civil War era, it reached 34%, and then it was negative number for 20 years after the Civil War. So that's four instances. Two other instances, one of them relates to the period of 1805 to 1807, in which deflation was as high as inflation, so it probably averages it out. Another instance was not, you know, right after 1937 crisis, uh, which again was followed by a decade of deflation. It was short-lived. So that really only leaves two instances. One of them is the 1960s when it reached 5.9%, which is not that high a number. And then the final instance was the 1970s, specifically the period of 1973 to 1982. Well, the one in the 60s, though mild, is pretty easy to understand. And by the way, in the 60s, government debt to GDP was actually declining. It was getting better and so the, the idea that Vietnam War and guns and butter was the cause of the in, inflation is, is probably not well-founded. Instead, what was going on is America was trying to defend the gold standard. And gold, which is 20,000 tons of gold in the U.S. in 1960, has declined to 10,000 uh, by 1970. It's because anybody that had any brains is cashing in their dollars for gold and selling that gold, which in the United States is $36 an ounce, selling it for 50 or 60 or $70 an ounce somewhere else in the world. So the United States preemptively in about 1962, at a point where there's no inflation, has to start raising interest rates to, to try to defend against this. Ultimately is unsuccessful. Nixon takes us off the gold standard and by 1972, inflation's back down to 3%. So to me, that's the story of the very mild bout uh, in the 60s. Then the most famous instance of inflation is in 1973 to 1982, when oil goes from $3.50 a barrel in the Yom Kippur War to $12, and then in the Iranian Revolution to $39 a barrel. So oil increases 10 times at a point where the United States is twice as oil inefficient as it is today, by the way. I remember the gas guzzler I drove. And of course we have inflation and that inflation is solved, in my opinion, not because of Volcker's 20% you know, interest rates, but instead because Carter and Reagan deregulated the price of domestic oil. Uh, uh, the, the, the production of oil booms as a result, 
rigs are everywhere and the price of oil goes from <clears throat> $39 a barrel to let's call it $20 a barrel by 1982 to $11 a barrel in 1986 and voila, inflation is gone. So in, in, in all of those cases, I can give you a kind of more common sense reason inflation in all of those instances, once you remove the cause, the inflation went away. So I want to only say one more thing and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> there, it, we don't print money. That's a popular expression that happens to not technically be true. But some economies in some periods have printed money. We printed money in the American Revolution. <coughs> What we do today is we issue debt. And that debt has a maturity and it has an interest rate. In essence, it has an accountability associated with it. But if you look at certain third world countries in the instances of hyperinflation, they did print money. And they printed money in quantities that approached the size of GDP in that economy itself. So I guarantee you that if you're in a third world country, <clears throat> your GDP is, let's call it $300 million, you, you know, equivalent dollars a year, and you start printing $200 million of paper money a year to cover government expenses, I guarantee you the value of your currency is de gonna decline. That is printing money. If you do that in extraordinary quantities, and I'll use the word extraordinary, it does bring inflation and sometimes hyperinflation. We don't print money in developed countries in Western Europe and the United States. We issue debt. Okay, thank you very much for that. I was just thinking about one last question then. Uh, all these examples that you took here, for me, it sounded like it was more of a supply disruption that led to the inflation. Could that be correct? That is perfectly expressed. I think the word, the proper word for it is exactly the word you use, which is supply depletion inflation. And by the way, I think that's what happened in COVID. You know, you know workers couldn't work. Supply chains were disrupted. Factories couldn't go to the meat plant um, to, to cut the meat you have a little bit of inflation as a result. I, 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 I analogize, I just published an article, I analogize where we are today with more of a wartime inflation scenario. <clears throat> okay, and in wartime, the solution was actually to expand productive capacity. Get the soldiers home from the war, to convert the uh, factories back from making tanks to making cars, and the inflation goes away. Oh, okay. So it's quite probable that that's the solution we should use today to, to enhance productivity. And by the way, you know, supply chains take longer to repair than you think they do. You know, it's, it's going to take us a year or two to get through this. And we got the whole Ukraine thing now that might prolong yeah. it a little bit. But basically, it's getting folks back to work, which, which won't happen overnight. You know, it, Operating things take longer to achieve than people think they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I get that, but uh, at least it should help if we know the direction that we should take instead of taking the wrong direction. Well, it gets back to your point, which is, if it's supply disruptions the issue, is it really wise to raise interest rates to solve the problem if that's really not the cause? Yeah. I think we stopped that because that's a very good question for people to ponder on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for taking your time with me again with these things. Thanks a lot. Thank you.